expert. Let's turn to Mark Parr, analyst at KeyBank Capital. He joins us from Cleveland. He knows a thing or two about the steel industry. Mark Parr, welcome and thank you for being with us. Uh, you're too kind. Thanks for having me, Pim. Mark Parr, tell me the state of the iron ore steel world right now. What are iron ore prices telling you about the steel business? Well, you know, this, this announcement last night out of Australia is really interesting. Because one of the big concerns domestic investors have always had is that you know, China is somehow going to figure out a way to cover the U.S. with cheap imported steel. And with this increase in pricing power by the iron ore producers, you know, China's competitive position has definitely been called into question today. And I think that's one of the reasons the stocks acted so well. Now, when you talk about being called into question, this has to do with Chinalco's investment in Rio Tinto. Now, the Australian government and various interest groups in Australia are saying, no thanks, we don't want this investment. What does well, that mean for the future? Well, no, it's not, it's not so much that. It's essentially the Australians said that they did not want the investment by the Chinese. And instead, you've got BHP and Rio Tinto, the two largest iron ore producers in the world, combining their assets together into a mega uh, basic material entity. So that means they're going to get some pricing power out of this. Against the Chinese, that's correct. So China is going to have to end up paying more for iron ore than if they had more suppliers that they could theoretically, you know, balance off against each other. All right, so now what's the price of iron ore right now? You know, we've been tracking these negotiations. They're usually all sealed right. by April. It didn't happen that way this year. No, th well, this has been a really unusual year because of the collapse of the credit markets and you know, the, uh, the steel industry's response to uh, the, the weaker demand in, in all the, the uh, capacity and supply cutbacks. But uh, we, since, uh, since we've seen some inklings of iron ore contracts coming out, and these are uh, the fines contracts coming down about 33% from last year, you know, that's relatively good for the Japanese who don't use much in the way of fines relatively bad for the Chinese because that's what they really use as their primary input into their blast furnaces. Um, and at what, as soon as that contract was set, you've seen spot prices begin to move higher. You've definitely seen an increase in activity by Chinese buyers. And even freight rates have been moving up over the last couple of weeks. You know, this action last night by the Australians, I mean, really, would, would t if, it's, if it's, they're able to make it happen, this is something that could really put, kind of seal the deal on those preliminary pricing discussions you know, between the Australians and the Japanese as far as the rest of the world is concerned, and actually a very positive development for the steel industry globally relative to what the market was afraid of earlier in the year. Mark Parr, educate us a little bit. You talked about the difference between the inputs of iron ore going into Japanese steel and what the Chinese right. use. You talk about fines. Tell us about that. Well, you know, iron ore comes in a number of different forms, you know, and when you're dealing with integrated steel making, you're talking about turning iron ore into steel. And so each mill and in each industry, a regional industry, has their own idea of the best, most cost-effective blend to go into this. The Japanese use a combination that favors more lumps of ore and less percentage of fines. Lumps are more expensive, but they theoretically produce a higher quality product. The Japanese, which have been more focused on cost, have been focused much more heavily on a fines mix into their uh, blast furnace operations. You mean the Chinese for fines? Yes, the Chinese for fines. Uh, pardon me. Yes. That's, that's okay. Just keeping it all straight. Thank okay. you. Mark Parr, then let's turn now, if we can, to some of the stocks I know that you're following. Okay. Steel Dynamics is one of the stocks that you think ought to be in people's portfolios. Right. What's the story with Steel Dynamics right now, and how do they benefit? Well, you know, Pim, what we've been, what we've been seeing, say, over the last several months is some gradual improvement of macro data points. But in the last week or so, we've seen more industry-specific data points that are encouraging. And just in the last several days, really this past week, we've seen the first flat-rolled price increase announcements by the U.S. producers. And you know, this is really, I think, resulting in a significant improvement in order momentum. And investors are really looking to these stocks more aggressively now that actual industry momentum is beginning to pick up. You know, before that, we were really just kind of focused on the macro data points and hoping the industry would get better. Now we're actually beginning to see some real recovery. 
All right, so you've got a buy on Steel Dynamics, also Nucor, AK Steel, and yes. Reliance. Yes. But you don't have a buy on U.S. Steel. Why is that? Just give us the detail of the business mix. Well, U.S. Steel is, is going to have to deal with its own iron ore mines, which in 2009 will put it at a modest cost disadvantage. Also, the other big headwind for U.S. Steel this year is the energy tubulars market. And with the collapse of oil prices that we saw late last year and into 2009, drilling activity has really fallen off. At the same time, we have a mountain of Chinese imported tubular products that has yet to be used in North America. These are things that are going to take U.S. Steel's earnings power a little longer to come around than some of the other names. Now, you like these mini mills, correct? You think that that yes. also is a good place for people to put money? Well, the cost structure is a lot more flexible. And, you know, the, the capacity decision that uh, an electric arc furnace producer has to make is based on one heat at a time. So a new core or steel dynamics can decide to take on additional orders or make additional capacity, say 160 tons, 200 tons at a time. It's a very, very minute increments or decrements, depending on how the market is going. All right, Mark, we can't, we can't make more time, but we can when you come. We're, we're not going anywhere. All we're right. going to have more with Mark Parr. We're going to find out about some industrial stocks that he also thinks you might want for your portfolio. Talk about a company called GraphTech, and also we'll talk about the airline industry. This is Taking Stock on Bloomberg. I'm Pim Fox. My guest is key bank analyst and expert in the world of all things steel, Mark Parr. Mark Parr, give us a little bit of a lesson in terms of what is a blast furnace and what's an ele electric arc furnace and why that distinction is so important if you want to invest in steel. Yeah, well, yeah, what, what we were talking about at, at the end of the last section was for an electric arc furnace producer to make a capacity decision. He can literally do it one heat at a time or 150 or 200 tons at a time. For an integrated producer to bring on more capacity, they have to restart a blast furnace, which could be one to two million tons of additional capacity. So one of the reasons that we favor electric arc furnace producers here at the early phase of the cycle is that those, those initial capacity decisions are a lot more easily made in small increments then you know, before you, you, know, you, you want to make a decision to turn on a huge blast furnace, you've got to really make sure that the market is in a recovery mode. You know, here we're still in a nascent stage, and we think the EAF uh, road is the way to go early in the recovery process. All right, so electric arc furnaces, if you believe that scenario, yes. that's steel dynamics, that's new core, AK yes. steel, for example. Yes. That's correct, yes. All right, now let's turn to the company that is kind of in the middle, but one we always want to talk about. Bring us up to date on what's going on at GraphTech. You've also got to buy there. Yeah, I mean, Gra GraphTech is is for somebody that wants a little more global exposure. I mean, GraphTech makes a lot of sense. It's very intensely involved in the steel supply chain. You know, and, and GraphTech produces the electrodes that actually conduct electricity into the electric arc furnace. This is a consumable in the steel making process. And this industry is very consolidated on a global basis, both in terms of electrode manufacturing, where the top four or five companies comprise well over 60% of the global market, but even more importantly, the raw material flow into the market. And this is, this is, called, this is a grain-oriented coke called needle coke. And this needle coke is a critical, irreplaceable element in the manufacturing process. There's only four places in the world where you can buy this. And so there's been a tremendous amount of supply and pricing discipline that's been maintained in this market, even though the demand scenario has fallen off a cliff in line with everybody else. Mark Parr, it's possible that we all have a lot of time over the weekend. What are those four places where we could go and visit that needle coke production? Well, two of them would be in Japan and the other two would be in Texas. So, all right, so if we make that trip, that's what we find out. And then you say graph tech benefits because it's an essential part of the steel making business. Yes, it is. And because, you know, the, the execution momentum these guys have with uh, cost reduction and productivity enhancements, very solid balance sheet right now. I mean, this is a great small cap name, a small cap portfolios. Uh, I think really would benefit from taking a strong look at this stock uh, 
particularly given the fact that it seems to have lagged some of the steel producers over the last couple of weeks. Mark Parr, tell us about what's going on at Cliffs Natural, because this is really yes. the result of a consolidation. It kind of took place at the height of the market, didn't it? Well, I mean, Cliffs tried to, uh, to engage a merger with Alpha Natural Resources, which was, was ultimately not successful. And uh, what, but what Cliffs has done over the last several years is they've diversified their North American iron ore and met coal into both Australian and Brazilian properties. So this is an emerging global mining entity. Uh, we, we think that given the fact that the U.S. iron ore market has got plenty of, uh, of material in the supply chain, it's a little bit later on the recovery cycle than right. some of the EAF producers are. So we still don't have a buy on cliffs yet, but it's definitely something that the market's been interested in, and All we right. would look for market interest to increase Mark given Parr. what's going on in Australia. Mark Parr, thank you very much. Coming to us from Key Bank about steel, this is Taking Stock on Bloomberg.